So yeah, my name is Sarah Taylor Lovell, and I'm in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. So as you can imagine, the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois is very corn, soybeans, corn and soybean oriented, so I'm definitely on the way far end of the spectrum of probably what goes on with sustainable agriculture and diversification of agriculture in general. Uh, my background is a little bit unusual. I got my master's and PhD in agronomy focusing on weed science. Worked in industry for a while. I worked for Dow AgriSciences for a few years and then decided to go back and get a master's in landscape architecture. So I bring that kind of design background into the frame as well. So right now I'm working on projects that are related to, some related to urban agriculture, but maybe more recently it's oriented more toward agroforestry. So I'm attempting to kind of merge those two together under the theme of adaptation and mitigation of climate change. So we'll go through this. And I guess feel free to answer or to ask questions as we go, and I'll do my best to keep things on track. So when we talk about um, working in urban agriculture, we're talking about opportunities to potentially create more of a closed system for cities. So typically in an urban environment, you have, might have a lot of inputs coming from the, the outside landscape. So a lot of the food coming in from outside sources, a lot of resources and materials, and then shipping off all the bad things, all the waste products. Um, but instead we might think about how we can reuse and recycle a lot of those materials. And we like to think about urban agriculture as being a really good opportunity to use some of those waste materials. Like if you think about waste food materials and things like that that can be composted and then reused as nutrients in urban agriculture. And even um, just waste products that can be put together and kind of reused in ways to create structures and things like that for urban agriculture. So there's been a lot of interest in urban agriculture recently, and we'll just define this very simply as growing food in the urban environment. It can also include livestock in the urban environment. Um, but I would, I would suggest that it's actually difficult to justify urban agriculture just on the food production basis alone, particularly since you're talking about land that oftentimes has a lot of competition for uses, it can be expensive land. Um, sometimes it really is easier to grow food in an area where you have a lot more space. You're not at all constrained for space. You're not constrained for light. But um, urban agriculture does have a lot of other benefits that I think help justify its use. So I like to use this multifunctional landscape framework, not just for urban agriculture, but I really use this for all of my research program, this overall framework. And um, this is one that basically says that we can integrate ecological, cultural, and production functions. So take these all together, and what it really focuses on is considering the site-specific context. So in this situation, the context is the urban environment. So that's going to be very specific. There are going to be a lot of differences in what those functions are based on the fact that it's in a city. And then also the needs of the users. And so in a rural environment, our users are, we're typically just thinking about the farmers and landowners in the rural environment. In the urban environment, the users can be all sorts of people. In fact, you know, the residents of the community that are just driving by and enjoying that landscape. There can be people who are working on that urban agriculture site. So this really plays a lot into how we design these systems so that they do kind of develop these different functions. So we're basically saying that we can stack the cultural, ecological, and production functions and attain a, a greater level of landscape performance overall. <clears throat> the concept is really similar to sustainability. Um, and if you think about like the environmental aspect is like the ecological, the economic production. And so the thing about the sustainability model is that it su suggests that you have to kind of find that interface between those three dimensions which can be kind of challenging for people who are trying to design the landscape. It's just, you know, it's, it's really something that's hard to grapple with. Like, what does that mean? When have you achieved sustainability? When are you taking care of all those at the greatest extent? So instead, by focusing on the, this performance uh, 
framework and the landscape multifunctionality framework, you can really just think about trying to add on these different functions. Our and specific functions are things that we can try to um, plan for, we can try to design the landscape for more specifically. So what am I talking about with these different functions? Um, production functions are the ones that we typically think about with any sort of agricultural system. It can be the production of food or herbs, um, food for processing, could be medicinal products, firewood, livestock, um, different forms of fiber, even things like cut flowers or Christmas trees can be production functions. There's a lot more interest growing in the area of ecological functions of agricultural landscapes. <clears throat> so this is things like um, conserving biodiversity, recycling nutrients, uh, microclimate control, carbon sequestration. In the urban environment, we really want to focus a lot on the cultural functions because we have people in this environment. <clears throat> so thinking about cultural functions related to an agricultural landscape is kind of unusual in the U.S. It's not that unusual in like European landscapes. They are a lot of times thinking about integrating recreation in the agricultural landscape and thinking about visual quality and retaining cultural heritage. But it's not as common in the U.S. to do that. So we really have to be careful in our urban environments to think about things like the recreational value, the visual quality aspect of what we're designing, cultural heritage, um, ethnic reflection, these types of issues. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the previous work that our group has done in urban agriculture, mostly in Chicago. And one of the first things that we did when we started really looking at urban agriculture in Chicago is try to characterize how extensive food production is in the city. There had been a lot of claims about um, community gardens, like there were claims that Chicago had 600 community gardens and that that could really make a huge impact on the food supply. But when we started actually visiting some of these 600 community gardens, um, we found that many of them weren't, there was no evidence of anything community garden oriented. In other cases, there were plantings, but there was nothing edible about them. And so <laughs> either they were defining community garden very differently than we were, or <clears throat> people just weren't tracking it very well. So that was one of the first things that we did was actually want to verify the community gardens that were there. But we were also interested in looking beyond the more well-known community gardens and urban farms and also considering the food production that occurs in backyard spaces. So basically, th this was a pretty extensive project. Um, basically found that there is a lot of urban agriculture prevalent, and it's a prevalent land use type in Chicago. To do this, basically it was a scanning of satellite imagery, kind of looking for the signature of what food production gardens would look like. And so it would be typically looking for gardens in a more traditional type of planting, like row space planting like you would see in a typical vegetable garden. So if anything, the material I'm presenting would probably underestimate what the actual food production space is because anything that would, would have been done below the tree canopy wouldn't be picked up. Anything that had a more organic form to it that was still food production, we wouldn't have been able to pick that up. And, um, and we did verify the, the gardens that, um, did a sampling of the gardens that we selected and I think it was like 89% accurate on detecting the ones that were there, that were actually food producing gardens. We also distributed, um, looked at the distribution and correlated that with demographic data in the city to see, you know, if there were certain neighborhoods or ethnic groups or socioeconomic status groups that were correlated with the number of community gardens. Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry, hold on. Oh, okay, those, those are just related to the, the um, community garden spaces. Those are just for our own. I should have explained, though, here that each one of these pins is basically showing a backyard garden. And so this is just showing in one little section, one little neighborhood, the alleyway, basically, how many different backyard food production gardens there were in that neighborhood. And this is previewing a little bit that we do find some clustering of where these gardens are. Like there can be some neighborhoods where you wouldn't have 
any pins on where the food production spaces were growing, but then other areas where there was a lot of clustering of the gardens. Okay, so here are some results of, of the extent of community gardens that we found. Um, I'll first point to the community food garden one there, um, finding that we had 135 community gardens, not 600, as they had suggested. And so every single one of those 600 gardens we did visit to actually find out if it was a community garden. So then the other ones, there are, other, there are urban farms, there are school gardens. Um, but then the next important one here is look at this residential garden line. So it had by far the most in number, about 4,000 different backyard residential gardens. And even in terms of area, it was the largest group in terms of the area of space in community gardens. And when you combine this with the single plot vacant lot garden, which if it's a single plot, that's usually an adjacent plot to a homeowner. So both of these are cases where it's like one homeowner probably working on this food production space. Those two combined account for more than half of the space altogether in food production. So and there had been so little research done on this backyard food production aspect compared to community garden pieces. So um, that's what we decided to focus on. Here's a map of the distribution of those two groups, the residential garden and the single plot vacant lot garden. And you can see that they aren't distributed evenly across the entire city. There are definitely clustered areas where there are more community garden or more residential garden spaces. And again, these are all food producing gardens. Yes. So, I mean, most of, so this is just, this is a map of Chicago, and um, so this is the whole city of Chicago. So I should have given you a little bit more information. So like downtown, the Chicago Loop area is there. So the more built environments, you're li likely to see less of the uh, backyard garden spaces. And so most of it is in residential areas. And particularly for this map, these would all be only in residential areas. But we did see like this, this food, the school gardens and some of the urban farms located in other areas as well, like even parks, park spaces. OK, good question. <coughs> so then to kind of drill down a little bit deeper, we're interested in looking at several of these different communities where we were seeing clustering of these community ba or these backyard garden spaces. So we looked at three different communities in Chicago and did both very intensive interviews, multiple interviews with the residents and some field observation work as well as soil sampling and some other work in the field there. And so we looked at one community that was mostly an African-American community, another the community that was um, Chinese origin, and then another that was Mexican origin community. And so this is, you can see the sample sizes here. We went for, tried to get about 20 participants in each one of those groups. You can see the demographics here. I'll just point to the lot sizes are a little bit different. And a lot of that's based on the land area that they would have available. So the African American sample was in a community where there was a lot of vacant lot space. And so their gardens tended to be considerably larger because there was plenty of land actually to use. There's more land than they could use. Um, the Chinese origin sample, they were in a much more dense area, so they were using smaller spaces, and the Mexican American or Mexican origin community was kind of in the middle. Uh, well, so something that was interesting is that we looked at, we did like plant biodiversity and looked at the structure of these different gardens, and we saw some really unique characteristics which, with each one of the ethnic groups. So just looking at the structure of the gardens, this would be a typical one from the African-American community where, again, they have those big vacant lot areas that they have access to. So they would do a pretty standard kind of row crop uh, structure of how they're doing their vegetable production. This one's in the Mexican origin community, and they were just using a lot of these interstitial spaces to grow tropical corn and some other crops that they were interested in. In the Chinese origin, uh, community, 
This is the type of structure you'd see where this, they would actually develop a lot of these vertical trellising structures, a lot of times out of found items. And this isn't just unique to Chicago either. We see this in some of the Chinese origin community gardens, even in Champaign-Urbana, where we're at now. They'll build just these beautiful, intricate structures that allow this multi-layer approach to gardening. And then looking at, <coughs> at the plant assemblages that they had, each of these communities had unique species that they were growing in these areas. In the African-American community, black-eyed pea, collards, kale, some others. In the Mexican origin gardens, we saw a lot of different species of chilies, lamb's quarter, sugar cane. Um, and the Chinese origin garden had a really diverse mix of um, different types of Chinese lettuce and celery, a lot of unique species from those. And what we found from the interviews was that a lot of these communities, both in the Chinese origin and in the Mexican origin communities, were getting their seeds from home. They were being sent from their original homeland. And so all of the growers in both of these groups um, were immigrants to the US. And so they were getting seeds, probably maybe not always legally <laughs> through the mail from relatives and everything. But it was really unique for them. So they were able to grow crops that helped them connect to their cultural heritage and provided them with something that they weren't able to obtain in some of the local grocery stores. <clears throat> OK, so what did we conclude from this research? Basically found that these backyard home gardens did supply some great ecosystem services, some great benefits to the growers but that there are also some downsides. There are also some disservices. So home gardens definitely contributed to local food systems. They were you know, growing a lot of crops in these gardens. They were sharing them with their neighbors. And so there's kind of a whole food way connected to the foods that they were producing. We also found that they were providing culturally appropriate foods. So when we think about the food security definitions, a lot of them have an aspect to them that is about the culturally appropriate aspect of that. So that was the upside. The downside was that we found in a lot of cases the gardens were relying very heavily on external inputs. So we like to envision and think that these home garden spaces are going to be using composted materials, a lot of recycling and things like that. But in reality what we found was that they were using a lot of synthetic um, fertilizers and other chemicals oftentimes way higher levels than they actually needed to. And so in some cases, like the phosphorus levels were extremely high in their gardens, which is not ideal in an urban setting to have extra nutrients in there. So some issues with that. Um, also some concerns with the soil contamination issue. So in Chicago, the city basically considers all of the residential lots to be contaminated with lead. And that's based on the, the age of the housing stock. So, I mean, it's a pretty good assumption that there's at least some lead in the soil because almost all of the housing stock was built when there was lead-based paint. And it basically, the paint chips off into the soils, get mi gets mixed up in, into the soils. And so that is a potential threat to food safety that we need to consider. Yes, there's a question. Um, I have right Yeah. And what it is is that they use metal smelting clay below almost every paved surface in the whole city. Mm -hmm. And that came up at like very high. Um, is anybody that you know of working on um, economically feasible remediation approaches to this type of thing? There are definitely people looking at that strategy. And, an, and another thing, so the question was kind of about are people looking at remediation strategies to deal with the contamination issue. There are definitely, there are people looking at that. There are also people looking at how we can grow foods still in those soils but reduce the risk substantially. So with lead, it's in many cases, the crops aren't actually taking up the lead into their edible portions. In a few cases, you might see a little bit of that, but for the most part, the biggest risk is that the soil itself adheres to some crops more than others. So like soil that splashes up on leafy greens 
um, is difficult sometimes to wash off, and so people are consuming it that way. The other concern is people working the soil and the dust, the lead in the dust of the soil being a problem. So th but there are some things, ways to manage that, like using mulches can help a lot. Specifically selecting crops to avoid the uptake of lead can also help. So I guess that's maybe the area I'm leaning a little bit more into, but the remediation aspect is, you know, there are really expensive ways to do that, like drag out all the soil and replace it with something completely clean, cap it. There's a lot of the cap and fill kind of concept, cap it and bring in new soil, but you're still like, from a sustainability perspective, you're still bringing in, trucking in a lot of material one way or the other. So um, yeah, some different thoughts on that. Okay, so soil contamination issue. And then here's the one um, that I think is interesting for our conversation today, is that we found that these home gardens were conserving a lot of biodiversity. They were very diverse. There were a lot of different plants, but they mostly lacked trees and shrubs to provide that structural diversity. And as it turns out, um, finding basically that crops may actually be displacing native or ornamental vegetation that you would normally see in backyard spaces, that gardeners are probably avoiding planting trees and, sh and shrubs because they really want to get that sunlight into the space. Um, and also, you know, to be able to cultivate those food crops. They may even be removing, in some cases, the trees and shrubs that help some with the biodiversity and some of the other benefits that we get. And so we started to ask this question about, you know, to what extent does urban agriculture become a little bit incompatible with some of the other efforts, particularly those that are oriented toward climate change issues like the urban forestry efforts. So there's all this emphasis on the tree canopy in different urban areas and things like that, which is really, uh, you know, not compatible with the urban agriculture that, we're that we see. And in this image, you can kind of see that it's a little bit blurry here, but this is an aerial view of, this is a residential lot right here. Here's their food production space. So they've got, in this case, they have a bunch of raised beds and then kind of mulched paths in between these. There's really no trees in this lot right here, but right next to it, the neighbors, their backyards are completely filled with trees and shrubs. So that becomes a question of, you know, how do we deal with this? How do we think about this? Um, are there opportunities to get both the benefits of trees and shrubs and get some food production going on? And so that's the direction that we're kind of going now, is looking beyond just the annual production in urban agriculture, but looking at the other opportunities. Oh, yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so we know that trees and shrubs provide a lot of ecosystem services for cities. There are a lot of benefits. The microclimate control aspect is really important. That helps to mitigate the urban heat island, which can reduce your energy costs. So there are definitely climate change implications of that. The carbon sequestration aspect, so thinking about mitigating climate change issues, um, can be important with the woody, woody biomass, both above and below ground with trees. Provides habitat and food resources for urban wildlife. Visual quality is, uh, you know, most preferences for visual quality indicate that people prefer landscapes that do have settings with trees and shrubs in them. So this work really draws on a number of different disciplines and really thinking about a different type of solution for these spaces. So first of all, it draws from a lot of material from horticulture and some of like the old literature of horticulture of just, you know, looking at tree crops, um, fruit and nut species, that are already available that we can start integrating into these spaces. It also draws on the material coming from permaculture, which is a kind of a little bit more recent interest in this area, which is the idea of a permanent agriculture, that we can use perennial species that are also productive. And so bringing those together in really diverse mixes. And then finally, it does draw on agroforestry as well. And Agroforestry is something that we usually talk a little, we, we talk about more for rural landscapes, thinking about how we can integrate trees and shrubs with crops or livestock. And this image is a good one. It shows all, a number of different ty types of agroforestry. So this right here is an alley cropping system where you can take a field that could be annual crops grown in between and then you do trees in the alleyway. Oftentimes those are timber trees, so there hasn't been a lot of work looking at the trees themselves having a food security component to them. 
Then there are windbreaks that are around farmsteads, there are riparian zones. Um, this is called a civil pastoral system where you integrate the livestock with the trees. And the trees provide a lot of benefits, even for livestock. They provide shade that's a much more comfortable environment for the livestock. And again, the trees can be productive in terms of being timber species or providing even items that can fall on the ground and the livestock could eat directly. Uh, we also draw on uh, what we consider one of the best pieces <laughs> of literature out there, Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith. We love this material. He was an American geographer, but had a, definitely a mindset toward agriculture and was really interested in looking at landscapes in the Midwest and actually throughout the U.S. and how we could do a lot better job of integrating crops that produce fruits and nuts that are woody species and use those to provide the benefits. He was really interested in reducing erosion on the landscape. That was a big topic in the 1950s when this was um, published. So basically, thinking about the trees themselves being a productive component of the system, and then recognizing you can have a lot of diversity in this and also offer healthy options for human or livestock, livestock consumption. So we've been working on a number of projects that we've started to lump under the theme of agroforestry for food. And so it's basically using that agroforestry framework, especially the one with alley cropping, where we have rows of trees and shrubs, and then we can grow other things, like it could be vegetable crops in between those rows. And bring that together, and instead of using just timber trees or just any old native species, maybe in a riparian buffer, we're very specifically looking at species that themselves produce food for consumption. So if we think about this, you know, in the Midwest, we're thinking about an agricultural transformation that would pre be pretty substantial. It would take an annual system and turn it over into a perennial system, so the ground would be covered all the time. It goes from an entirely herbaceous system to a woody system, from a monoculture of corn or soybeans into a polyculture system that integrates a lot of different species, and hopefully taking an open system where I have things coming, inputs coming in and a lot of material going out into something that's more like a ecologically based system, closed type system. <clears throat> okay, so for a lot of our work, we've focused on trying to mimic the structure of a savanna ecosystem because that would have been one of the native habitats for our area. With some of the original concepts, we thought that it might be useful to at least conceptually think about how we're we replace the functions that are already in our landscape. So in our landscape, the rotation of corn and soybeans, we're looking at two crops that can provide some of the functional replacements. So chestnuts are a high starch crop like corn, hazelnuts are very high oil like soybean, so you get some of those same benefits. So it helps kind of deal with the arguments of we have this great need for starches and oils or whatever. Um, we also are interested in looking at different ecosystem services. So instead of just comparing things based on yield, we can compare them based on yield, we can compare them based on calories, but we can also compare them based on human health benefits, based on soil quality, based on carbon they're sequestering, and so looking at that more multifunctional approach. And then to make this a little bit more palatable to um, those who are more oriented toward conventional agriculture, we're thinking about how initially we would talk about integrating this on marginal lands. So on lands that maybe aren't as productive as the most prime farmland. And thinking about those spaces where um, it could be that there are wet spots or riparian zones, but it could also be fields that are smaller or irregularly shaped. And so cases where farmers moving on to bigger equipment are having really a difficult time even getting their large scale equipment in there. So those are kind of the targets we see. This is a type of structure that we've looked at for our system. So we have an upper canopy layer, chestnut, pecan, or persimmon could fit in this layer. A medium tree or kind of understory layer it could be hazelnut, uh, cider apple, pawpaw. Then between the trees we do a shrub layer and we have a number of different shrubs that we look at including blackcurrant, elderberry, and aronia. And then you can't really see it but what would be in between these rows of trees then 
what could be anything, but in our case, we're interested in looking at forages as something that it's easy for us to manage. In theory, you could graze those forages. You could put livestock in between the trees and shrubs. Not something we're doing on our research plots because of the fear of um, if the animals had access to the plant material, if, you know, if we had electric fence and it broke or something and destroyed our research, we're not willing to take that risk, but in theory that could go. So again, this multi-layered system allows all the plants to explore a lot of different niches because you have multi-layer above ground, but also below ground, the root systems also take advantage of a lot of different aspects like nutrient cycling and using water at different levels. So you get carbon sequestration benefits, water quality benefits, diversification of enterprises because you have a lot of different species, and healthier food options too. So, you know, we're not just doing the replacement of starch and oils, we're also bringing in species that are good for direct human consumption as well. This just shows the layout of our field trial that was established about three years ago now. And so it's a very large scale study. It has seven, seven different treatments in it that are each replicated four times. Each one of these, each one of the numbers indicates the treatment and I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see that better. And even this one shows it a little bit better. Um, you can see each one of these plots here is about an acre in size. So the whole scale of this trial is about 30 acres. And you can see it for scale here are some of the vehicles. Down here are some of the cars and trucks. So we have, again, it's, it's an alley cropping system where the trees and shrubs are in rows. And then we have the forages planted in between those. Zooming in here, we have... We do have corn and soybean as the comparison. It's kind of a weird comparison in that it's so extremely different. But if we are looking at things like soil, carbon in the soil and things like that, it is worthwhile to look at the long-term impacts of having a woody system versus a conventional um, cultivated system. And two, we have monocultures of our different species, including, so we have hazelnut, chestnut, uh, apple, cider apple, and currants. And then with, with each one of these, three, four, five, six, and seven, we get more and more diverse with the system. So we start pretty simple with just chestnuts and hazelnuts. We add in currants with four. In six, we add in the cider apple. Then seven is this crazy diverse system that's all native species that we're interested in looking at as potentially an alternative to like the conservation reserve program. A lot of these species would work fine in a windbreak program. Uh, we have things like pawpaw, American hazelnut, uh, juneberry, um, persimmon, plum. So, yeah, in that one, again, it's more of, it's a less managed approach, more species that would, you could, in, because they're native, they would make a lot of sense in conservation programs. If anybody wants to follow what we're doing, we do have a Facebook page called Agroforestry for Food, and that's where we keep a lot of information updated. But then wrapping this back into the urban ag situation. So again, we're, we're talking about transitioning urban agriculture into potentially having trees and shrubs, which in general is gonna have a lot of benefits in terms of sequestering carbon and the microclimate control piece. So some of the ideas that we have for looking at this. So again, we know there's a lot of, a lot of marginal and underutilized land in the city like way more land in some neighborhoods than you could ever do cultivated food production because there are way more people in some of the, or way more, there's way more vacant lots than there are people in a lot of these neighborhoods to actually do anything with it. And this just shows an example of like one little street block in Chicago. This would be a single vacant lot right here. And the vacant, the lots are pretty standard. They're about 25 feet wide by about 125 feet deep. But then you have sections where there are maybe three lots in a row or even larger sections where a bunch of the lots are actually vacant and the houses have been removed. And so we can imagine um, planting those with, in more of an orchard style as opposed to trying to do uh, vegetable production. This map here, again, this is Chicago where a lot of our research is. There is an orange dot for each one of the lots that the city owns. So the city of Chicago owns about 11,000 vacant lots that they have addresses for. So you can basically map those out. And you can see, again, that they're very clustered in a couple of regions in Chicago. 
Um, also, so the city only owns 11,000 compared to the estimate that there's about 70 or 80,000 actual vacant lots in the city, if you include the other privately owned ones. Okay, also interesting to think about is the whole soil contamination issue. So trees are definitely, tree crops are going to lessen that food safety issue related to soil contamination because they're putting out their edible products way off the ground, uh, not seeing much translocation of lead into the edible portions of the tree species. They're stable, so because they're perennial, you're not um, cultivating the soil and, and bringing up the dust for when you're working on the crops. So this could be really important. And just to kind of highlight the issue of soil contamination in general, this map shows um, these darker areas are where there are high blood lead levels found in um, individuals in those environments. And I think it's worth noting that these overlay <coughs> a lot of different communities <coughs> where we're seeing differential impacts of the lead issue. Like if we look at the distribution of black communities, it overlays a lot of this. Also where a lot of the vacant lots are. So these are lower income areas, lead's more difficult, so it's kind of this layering of challenges for those communities. So another thing to think about with tree crops is that we could actually tie these into some of the tree canopy and greenway efforts that are going on in cities. So instead of um, competing really with the tree canopy stuff where we want sunlight for our vegetables, they want tree canopy for um, their microclimate control, thinking about how we tie these together. There's this idea of continuous productive urban landscapes, sea poles, which is a neat book. If um, any of you haven't seen that, that's a good one to look at. It really starts to think about how we connect these agricultural spaces so we can have some of these larger park areas that have community gardens in them, even larger farm, urban farms. Um, but how do we tie those together? More like we would, you know, the corridors that would go between ecological habitats. And then the idea that we're producing food where people are going to be eating it, there's a lot of population there, consuming it where it was actually grown. And this is more of a conceptual idea of having these larger urban agriculture spaces and then these corridors of agriculture that connect those. And on the ground, they might look like this. It might be rooftop gardens that are built spaces there. Looking at Chicago again, you can see how you could integrate agriculture in some of the connected spaces in the city itself. And this map just shows basically the lighter green are the Chicago parks, there are forest preserves. There, for the connected spaces, there, there's this boulevard network that connects a lot of the major parks in the city that are these really wide spaces in between the streets that are opportunities potentially. And then campus parks would be like school gardens and school spaces that, that are large enough to actually produce food in them. Uh, as we start to think about this and get more f fruit trees, nut trees into the urban environment, there are some good resources out there. One is this falling fruit map, fallingfruit.org, that maps trees in all over the world. <coughs> and you can go into almost any urban area and look through, um, search your area, find these individual dots where people are just mapping out trees and shrubs that have edible components to them and have descriptions. So this is just, you click on one of those dots and there may or may not be a good description of what's there and maybe whether it's on public land so you could actually um, not have to worry about asking anybody before harvesting or may, there might be notes in there about, you know, the homeowner is fine with people harvesting or something like that. So a really interesting resource for people. And again, gleaning fruit can be an opportunity for people who are looking for food for themselves or are trying to um, get healthy food for, um, for food pantries and things like that. Okay, so there are a lot of different edible landscaping alternatives that we can integrate into public spaces. We have shade trees that can produce food, fruits and nuts. Um, low maintenance orchard trees could be added into areas. There are some great understory plantings like pawpaw and amelanchor that could work well. <coughs> shrubs that can be used as hedges, and ground covers like strawberry and lingonberry. 
So good options there. We can think about community orchards that can be added into public parks. And this is an example of one um, that was done kind of a similar design to what our research trials are, where it's, it's somewhat set up as an orchard, but then you have shrubs or other perennial species in between the, the tree crops. We can think about even integrating the tree crops in with the cultivated crops. This is an example that shows buffers that could be added around an urban farm. So you have your vegetable production grow, going on in the interior space, and then these edible or otherwise productive buffer areas. And think about that. This is one example where there might be a parking lot here. So you have a stormwater management system next to that, um, a built structure over here. And this width basically is what three lots wide would look like for production space. Um, and then thinking about future climate conditions and how we select species um, based on that. So looking at native species and those that are really well adapted, adapted to future climate variability. So some of the favorites that we talk about, I mean, there are a lot of different options and it depends on your area, but um, for our area in the Midwest in Illinois, these are some of our favorites. Nut trees that provide shade, store carbon, and supply starch and oil can include things like American hazelnut, which is, again, a really high oil species. Good has good ornamental characteristics as well. Chinese chestnut then has the starch, valuable crop itself, and it's a very heavy producer. Pecan is a nice one. It's native to the Midwest, doesn't have a lot of pest problems, and one thing I like about it is it's, it allows a little bit more dappled light through the canopy, so you could potentially grow other species underneath it. Some fruit trees that we look at, cider apple is one that doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Common pawpaw, that's the uh, native to Illinois, so we, we tend to like that one. American persimmon is an option. And then my favorite of all, I suppose, are the shrubs that produce small fruits that can, can be used for humans and wildlife. And these three are my very, very favorite species of all time. So aronia berry, how many of you have heard of aronia berry? Quite a few here, good. Yeah, so aronia berry is known for super high antioxidants. Not great maybe to eat fresh, but can be mixed in with other fruits, um, in a frozen and mixed with other fruits in a smoothie or something. Um, has very, very few pests and is a really nice ornamental plant. We actually have a lot of them on our campus that they planted as ornamentals, not as any production aspect. Juneberry also can be eaten fresh, um, ornamental characteristics, a lot of different species here. And elderberry, high antioxidants with that one, great at nitrogen cycling. So tree crops contributing to climate change, mitigation and adaptation to kind of wrap this up. From the mitigation component, if we have trees and shrubs in there, we're able to sequester carbon in the above and below ground material. They provide that favorable microclimate so we can reduce energy use. They have fewer energy requirements. Um, Fewer like synthetic fertilizers, which are a huge energy use to make synthetic fertilizers. And then from adaptation, we're dealing with um, tolerating disturbance like, like drought and flooding, contributing to biodiversity, and then protecting a lot of our resources like soil, water, and air too. So I think that's it. Yes. So that's what I have. Um, that's our website and then the Facebook page. and who's supported uh, our various projects on this.